Are you going to tell them that this is an experiment in living? It, it, yeah, okay. It is an experiment Well, oh, I living. thought last night when you admitted that the materiality of newspaper mattered to you, that we were done because that was really the only point. But we're going to try to continue. Okay. Go on with some, a few other things. Um, in the old tradition that Peter Eisenman himself sort of initiated uh, years back, we're going to have a dialogue. Uh, he had done that uh, for a long time, interviewing many people, many architects, and theorists. Jorge is one. And Jorge. Uh, and no, no. Uh, Raphael. And Chris Alexander. Rem remember? Poulhas. Chris, no, no, well, no, the no. famous one. Chris we used Alexander. to have bag, ask him. We had real brown bag lunches in the old style where, with food, with food, <laughs> with food, and, and not, a, not an audience, just concerned students. Well, yeah. Well, that's what these people are. Well, you hope. So, um, I hope anyway. this is not for entertainment purposes. But now, those interviews, he would really go after these guys. I mean, some of them, and it was great. Sometimes, Jorge, especially. Yeah, uh, Jorge. Yeah. And sometimes it was about their work, sometimes it was about their writing. And sometimes about their personality. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, you know, and then I was looking at Peter's interviews with other people about him, because, you know, he's been put on the, on the, couch a few times by a few other people and uh, you know I didn't see anybody who really looked at your buildings and asked you questions about those. Okay. Let's I do that. That's what would be different here. Good. In the tradition of the Socratic dialogue where argumentation is used to sort of sharpen the tools you know of knowledge you know whatever. Okay so. I'm cool. I wanted to start. We want to turn the lights on? With an, yeah. With a very important uh, I think uh, element in your work, which we call, I've called, uh, the Eisenman L, uh, which really will, as it turns out, and why are these just running like that? They're, they're not supposed to do that. <laughs> this is supposed to be one at a time, and, you know, good. So, <laughs> Anyway, we got a good start. <laughs> basically, Peter produced this thing. It is a cube with a cube missing from it, which is, uh, you know, one of eight if you were to make that cube, if you were to divide it into eight cubes, right? One would be missing. It, no, no it, 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 yeah, one is missing out of eight. Yeah. Right. So now that corner that's missing, here are the ways we could interpret it. I believe Peter has talked about it. Uh, you could either assume that it, this, uh, of course, is a bite taken out of the cube. You could assume... Moving toward biting all the way to a point at okay. the corner. That's right. It could recede. Recede. He, he animates it I mentally. Right. and imagines that it could recede to nothing or completely fill back up the entire yeah. cube. And be the same thing, either way. In a way A point is. or a, a square is the same thing. It's in between that's interesting. Yeah, the whole distance between these end conditions, that the right. whole cube would disappear, that this void would eat it all up, or that it would, uh, you know, recede and the cube would, you know, would overwhelm the void. Right. The other, of course, the bite taken out, the subtractive process, is a different thing that's a static condition. It's just that it's been taken out. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be additive, too. We could obviously have uh, con constructed that condition. Um, you know, if you looked at it two-dimensionally, you just put one cube on top of a larger uh, unit. So. These are implicit transformations or processes or understandings and readings. But then something happened. I think the you want to show them the, the images? I do, but it, I can't. He still doesn't <laughs> have it on. So is he working on it? Does anybody know up there? Thank you. That's OK. It's cool. So then, and maybe somebody could help Doug work on it, too. That would be great. You should make sure that they understand I promised them 50 pictures. Last night? Yeah, we're going to show them. We're going to show them, just so they know that we'll get to the 50 pictures if they are patient. But then I think there's a turning point. The idea of thinking about form that way and imagining what it might be as a process, 
uh, is a mode of thinking itself in a way that is somehow in, in, embedded in it, um, is changed when you try in later projects to iterate or to uh, build uh, a multiple kind of, uh, to, 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 to multiply, excuse me, the L. Um, you do it in a number of your houses, and then later you do it with many other kinds of forms. In this process of superimposition, uh, you are representing that process that you had imagined in the L. That is, that it would transform from one condition to another. You build all of those transformations, or some of them, and said, you built them and said, you know, it's a process. And we can see that it begins here. I, yes, I've got it. Uh, that it, it, it doesn't, it's, it's a process without a beginning and an end. You called it an unmotivated process and we don't need to go into the theorization of it I just want to be concrete well it was, a, it was first of all yeah I, I tried to make a difference between iteration and repetition uh, repetition was uh, the return of uh, the same and the iterative process is the return of difference mm -hmm. and of course we should say something that this project was my first project dealing with uh, the ground and the possibility of uh, the, the, a critique of, of the row figure ground idea that uh, the ground becoming figure. All right, so in addition to these L's, there is this in the, in the counter retro project, which is important, th this whole idea of a, a, a critique of figure ground. And at the time of Roma Interrota, of uh, Strada Novissima, of the whole axis between Creer, Roe, Portuguese, et cetera. All right? So there was that. Mm -hmm. and but, but I want to talk to you about something. Okay. And I think it's most. And this is the indexical here. project. The indexical project. This is. Uh, uh, yeah. This is. Find, find out, out house. house yes 1985 okay this house is where you take this l and you have uh, multiplied and scaled it yeah. and nested it into itself right. and the various grids represent different l's and so you have frozen this is a kind of you know a series of frozen shots of the l mm -hmm. um and i guess my question to you really is why can't you leave the L alone and just let it read? Let us see it for all that it represents. Why do you have to represent literally the thing changing, you know, from one state to another? Why did you animate it that way in freeze frames? Why, could, why isn't it already dynamic enough? You interpret it to, it to be already a process underway well, in the imagination, as it were, or in the reading uh, of it. Uh, uh, you ha we, ha we have to go back. First of all, we're talking about a different time and a different moment in time. So let's try and reconstruct what was going on at that moment. I was fascinated with the... Um, uh, avant-garde or conceptual filmmakers of the time. Michael Snow, uh, Peter Kubelka especially, the Austrian filmmaker who was doing um, what uh, uh, this kind of uh, stop frame uh, uh, animation of uh, flicker films, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. and, and the flicker film really interested me and I made for the Biennale of, of, of 73, a Flickr film of a, a process of architecture. Uh, and what happens is, uh, where, whereas we look at stable drawing, drawing one, drawing two, and, it, and our mind makes the connection between the two, all right? Mm -hmm. So that what seems to be rational is filled in by the mind's innate Ra desire for rationality. But it, when you speed up the film uh, to, uh, so that the mind doesn't have time, it just flickers uh, every second on, off, on, off, 
the rationality is destroyed because the mind doesn't have time to put together those images that are s stable and stationary. So what I realized was that the process of the drawing representing uh, the, the possibility of a rational transformational process was problematic. So when I got to these houses, what I was trying to do was to alter the process so that they were not sequential, but they collapsed into one another. In other words, that instead of saying these were transformations that led from A to Z, that in, in, in the filmic sense of the word, they were compressed together. So I would first work out all of the sequences, mm -hmm. see them uh, as it were rational as uh, to, to the eye, uh, as stable, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. And in this house particularly, I then took that time interval and compressed them together. That's why I did it. I know, but here's what I, mean, I know you why you did me why it. why I did it. Okay, but looking back or thinking now, please, if you will, if, imagine that, you know, you, you, you see this L and, it, and all of that it potentiates, it's full of potential. It's not the indexical project. It's about the condition of potentiality, which is very different. And I thought you also liked that idea in architecture very much, that it's somehow... In, you called it an arrow, or you, I, you had other ways er, to Error, start. error. I, well, I said moving arrow. arrows, yeah, eros, arrow. and other errors. Okay. Okay. And so in a way it is that, the L, but as soon as you freeze it, uh, then it enters into a kind of iconographic project, it seems to me, wherein it's actually trying to sort of be a picture of the process. It's not the potentiality that it That's was when it was just the L, not right. iterated, not inde indexed in all of its movements. Okay. Didn't you kind of, did you kill the L in a way by doing that? I don't know. I mean, I'm, I, I don't know what you think about that. I mean, because well, I think I'll the L... Well, i tell you what. I, first of all, we have to go back again to the moment in time. Yeah. And uh, Rosalind Krauss had just given the lectures and written uh, notes on the index, uh, one and two in, yeah. in October, two and three, or three and four, mm -hmm. but following Jeremy Gilbert Rolfe's idea of the index, which he claims to have been the first one she claims she was. But anyway, I was fascinated by the possibility of an indexical project, that is, of, of, of reading other than icon, uh, in other words, and I was interested in Peirce's uh, definition between uh, signs, I mean, mm -hmm. icon and, mm -hmm. and index, mm -hmm. uh, or symbol icon and index. Mm -hmm. uh, and that index was an internal referential uh, condition, uh, whereas an icon was related to a known condition outwardly. And I was arguing at the time that postmodernism was a return to the icon uh, and to the relationship to an external reference. And what I was working with with the index was something that was internal, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, does the, do those things have any any purchase today? No. All right. Do I care about those things today? No. Did I care about them then? Yes. Do these should these people care about them? Only to see the futility of of these kinds of uh, uh, of works. Uh, to be honest, I mean you know uh, they were important at the time. Uh, for 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 me, uh, do they remain important? No, they. I mean, I don't disown them, but to bring them up and say, well, what do you think about them now? <laughs> I think about them now the way I think about anything in 1972. Uh, they were good then, maybe. They don't mean anything today. But Peter, you you are you still doing many things that are very close you say to, that connected to this. I, well, I don't think so. Well, we're going to look at the later and find okay. out, I think. Okay. I mean, I, you know, okay. But, I mean... The simultaneity yeah. of more than one state yeah. of it right. but uh, I just is something what you're it absolutely, was. absolutely invested in today. We're going to see it in Santiago, the newest project. Well, you think that. Where we have a multiplicity of grids yeah. acting one on another. Right. And it's very related to this. It's, okay. You know, so, and, you know, so you can't tell me this is way back and it's just all... What is it? Wait, wait. Irrelevant First of all... Now. 
I didn't say it was irrelevant now. I'm saying Anybody. is, no, no, no. I said, first of all, when you hit Santiago, materiality comes in. Yeah, These, I know. The, I mean, and material, whoa. It's I mean, laid onto it, but then you still have. These not problems. laid onto it, well, within it. All right, embedded in it. Embedded in it. But I guess the part of this is always is that, you know, in a funny sort of way, the, the struggle against the, the iconic or the representational, the literal, is something I wanted you to think about. Because, well, it's always been there. Yeah, because you've been representing that very thing. I mean, and representing the, mm. the idea of the trace, which is an event. I mean, a trace is, is smoke or the, or the, of the fire, or it's the tracks of, uh, in the sand. And it's, it's, the, it's the, as you call the absence of presence, the passing of an event. It's not the event itself, and it's not a form transposed into architecture. You run into a very troubling problem with well, this. Well, that's assuming. You're still doing it. That you're assuming that, that presence is the ultimate um, um, transcendental signified. And Derrida argues, and this is why deconstruction is so important to this argument right now, is he would argue that there is no transcendental signified, and if there is no transcendental signified, there is no necessary presence as the underpinning of any of this, that it's a constant uh, iterative process that never stops and doesn't begin anywhere, and there is no origin. And but you've talked about presence in architecture. Presentness. No, and presentness is not presence. Presentness. Let's go to presentness, please. Let's shift to presentness. Okay. And it seems to me that the L, without the, uh, this whole process of uh, what you call the indexical multiplication of it, is presentness. No. Presentness, as, and this is different from Michael Fried's uh, determination of presentness, <coughs> presentness was the capacity of a critical idea to sustain itself beyond its time, i.e. Michelangelo's Laurentian Library, yes. still has a quality, a critical quality today, because it, it retains the energy of its original state and transcends its moment in time. But, well, you, OK, what, I, what I'm saying about the L, I mean, I'm not thinking about it in that kind of teleology of the, the night, you know, when uh, you, you invented it in the asked, 70s versus now and things like question. that. No, but what I'm saying about the L is that it, it retains potentiality until you literally stamp it out in all of its steps of transformation. Before then, it just embodies all those possible ways of thinking about its processes. Find out house was the end of a series of investigations about the L. No, 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 but when I'm, I'm not talking about, you know what, the L is an allegory of, an, of, a, of, a, of a different right. position in your work. For me, there are two thoughts in your work. One is that we read buildings or objects, and we read a process, a possible understanding. We know that they are embodiments of a certain kind of way of thinking, and you elucidate this kind of thinking through your criticism. And it is potentiated in the form in very particular ways. They and are the other texts. thing you do they is, are texts. Okay, they're texts. And then the other thing you do is literally represent how we read. You show it by actually making freeze frames of the of the time. In seventy two and seventy three. And you still do it. Okay. We're gonna talk about it. You okay. do it. And and, it's, and I think they're two different things. I'm saying the, the L alone was doing something very powerful in that potentiation, uh, and I think is related to the idea of presentness. While the indexical is a, a very different project, which deals with the literal representation of process. Right. And I think you have both in your work. The indexical project was the modern mystery novel brought to architecture that you had to solve what it, who, who did it, right, or how it was done, right? Okay. That's the indexical project, that even though it's self-referential, the idea was to find the clues to find out what was it self-referencing, referencing, right. right? There may be clues and traces in my work today, but the oh, what it, who done it and what it is is immaterial. Okay. That's not the goal of the project today. So the, the, the idea of the project is different than it was in 73. Okay. Now, I, I, I mean, that's a claim I make. Uh, history okay. could prove me wrong. Okay. I'm yeah. saying is 
for example, when you get to Santiago, first of all, the scale is different. So when you jump scale, uh, let's just talk about scale for a minute, which never entered into the work. Jim Sterling said to me <clears throat> very early on, Americans have no sense of, of the middle scale. Uh, they don't know how to do anything but a small house and blow it up. And I won't mention the names of the architects, but they're cl clearly uh, visible to you and me. Uh, that the, the, that we, we did not know how to do middle scale buildings. We just knew how to blow, blow up small scale ideas. So the minute you say there's a difference between a small scale idea and a middle scale or a larger scale idea, which is an interesting idea, <clears throat> something immediately changes. So now we're talking about scale. And when you change from the L houses to the Wexner Center, to Cincinnati, the Aronoff Center, uh, any of these projects of, of a middle scale, you're now talking about a different animal. And the control is different, the ideas are different, uh, materiality enters in, scale enters in, which never entered into before. So there's a, there is a radical change. Then, if we jump that and say, okay, here's the architect's dream, not to do a single middle scale building, but to do six middle scale buildings simultaneously, uh -huh. which, uh, in other words, and maintain the discourse of scale, so you're not, it, it hasn't just become a giant project blown up from a small idea. Uh, again, we're dealing with a different idea of materiality and scale, which is what we find in Santiago. So I would argue that scale had nothing to do with, with the indexical projects. They were, uh, scale only enters in when you leave the, the individual object and the individual subject and move, move to a collective subject and a collective object. Now, to me, that became really important. And the idea of doing a house ever again was uh, uninteresting yep. at all. Uh, the middle scale, what's interesting about your work and, and the work of some of your contemporaries is they got, overcame the house problem because they, op they operated initially at the middle scale. Um, hmm. And I think that if you look at the work of Tom Main, of Stephen Hall, of you, et cetera, uh, the, the house was never a problem. It was always that middle scale. And so uh, having graduated from the house projects, uh, I was interested in a, in a very different problem uh, and of course, uh, uh, if you look at the thing that all of the projects, Wexner, uh, Columbus, uh, Aronoff, uh, and, and Santiago have in common, is the linear uh, promenade, uh, which had nothing to do with the house. In other words, the subject's relationship to the space. There's another thing I want to just so touch on for a minute, which is right here, which is yeah. where we're going to go with Santiago in a way. Okay. Which is there's, there is an idea about the tectonic in your work, which is a negation of the tectonic. I mean, obviously here, everybody knows that what we're looking at, this is the Wexner Center where the column having been either lopped off, you know, at its bottom uh, or lifted from the ground or hanging because the whole building is literally, you know, laying on the ground and there is a hole under it here and that, build, that column could not descend into it, uh, having been, you know, remaining stuck up there with the rest of the stuff that it's part of. Here we have a coincidental sort of uh, dialectic between these purely abstract operations of the multiplicity of grids in different scales and different Correct. states of, of change and growth and change. And then we also have this. this dialectic with the undoing of the sign, the, what you call demotivating of the sign. The, mm -hmm. Unmotivating. The, yeah. But I you have to, there's another thing that enters. I have to make sure I, I make, sh uh, at Wexner, <clears throat> for the first time, the introduction of the historical artifact, that is the re-presenting of an artifact that was one, the castle, right, right? <clears throat> enters into a play with the unmotivated signs. Because what we're saying is, and up to this day, I, uh, my, uh, my project in Pompeii, the, the minister of, of Beni Culturale in Italy from Rome 
said, hey, Eisenman, you know, you're knocking down a railroad station, and putting up a new railroad station. Why can't you do what you did at Wexner and, and save the facade of the railroad station? And the only way we could get approval from this minister was to do a faux saving of a facade um, huh. and, and allowing us to build our railroad station. It's like Tehrani having to pretend. With That's right. No, no. Nova Cohen so, apartment. So we're, we're arguing uh, in, in all of the recent projects, uh, there is a, a, a seed of an historical artifact. This, the problem of scale, problem of material, problem of, 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 of the history, the trace of the history of the site. So these, these are very different concerns than animated the, the L and the houses. But, but the animation is in there as a kind of, well, trace of your thought on architecture. And it proceeds at, the, at these scales, I mean, in the Wexner, right. the multiplication of the system. There are many other things, of course. This kind of displacement of the perspective, for example. Right. Look at that, you know, uh, which comes from a kind of non-oriented uh, sense of the, uh, the relocating of architecture in a kind of non-oriented geometric disorienting of the subject condition. Yes, but well, you've rotated literally the grid into an oblique here, and that makes it quite different, except for the guardiola from all of those houses. Mm -hmm. That was tied to the site. So yes, it gets enriched as we move along. And then there's this. I mean, that's a very different thing. I, I guess I wanted to ask you a little bit about it because I mean, in this point. Well, the now, person who did this project sitting right here. Oh, yeah. So we have to be really careful. But um, yeah, I, I would that argue that, big trouble, you know, no, that this project is uh, about two surfaces, two topological surfaces, with, not the surface of the ground as a datum, but a, sur a surface below the ground and above the ground that uh, are purposely deflected off of one another, have no connection at all, and all we did uh, was to define that space between, as opposed to, let's say, the Corbusian, uh, in, ex, you know, uh, infinitely extendable horizontal space, or the Miesian uh, plinth and, 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 and columns coming down onto a plinth. We tried to define uh -huh. a, a, a different kind of space which is all you see there is the connection between the two surfaces. And that's the important thing. The, the columns are the poche between the surfaces. And, and all we did was connect the dots, uh, and that's what that is. Let's see, what I, I think is here is you use a, uh, what I think is so interesting. I just want to run a reading and see okay. if you kind of, the part to whole problem. I'm here, okay. here it's resolved in a way I don't think I've seen it, which is that the part which is not, it could be seen that the part is something like a gravestone, uh, but for the fact that it is part of a larger form, and then it, it cannot be simply what? that. It's part of a much larger formal and systematic construct. So we can't recognize it as a gravestone. Of course, it also has succumbed to many other transformations. On the other hand, this image, for example, uh, will have some resonances with the gravestone, and, and you know that, uh, the, the Prague Cemetery. But there, actually, and so what I find interesting, it's a little bit like the Wexner Center, where the column that uh, it's, it unmotivates the sign of structure in architecture becomes form through a relationship with a larger system. You use the idea of the systematic, mm -hmm. uh, uh, let's say, uh, what do you call iterative and indexical, to right. um, absorb other conditions into architecture, whether it be the tectonic, the, a critique of the tectonic, mm. or of the element that is an icon, in this case, the tombstone. I mean, I think there is a tombstone reference here, but that it is, it is erased. It is, as it were, unmotivated by the fact that this is some larger thing. I wish it were. You don't think it is enough? Well, first of all, Jacques Derrida argued with me that architecture will always mean uh, that is, you cannot, that's why he believes architecture is the locus of the metaphysical project. And uh, if we continue to think that, then we, we, we're, we're bound to that. And so I, my work since working with, with Derrida has been an attempt to unmotivate 
that possibility. In other words, that architecture will not always mean, okay? I mean, if you, why I like Michael Haneke's films, when he says code unknown, what he's saying is, you may think this is a mystery story, but it doesn't mean anything. Uh, you, you, you cache, meaning hidden. Uh, you're supposed to look for the clues as who done it. You never find out who done it because it, there is no who done it, right? And so the whole notion of giving false clues, whether they read as gravestones or whatever, uh, are false clues because you can't solve the problem because there is no solution to the problem. And if one could establish the fact that there is no solution in architecture and undercut the notion that architecture will always mean, then we are interested in the overcoming of the metaphysical project. Now, that's where I would like to think the work is. Is it possible to do? Have I seen it done? No. Do I see it in other discourses? I think Richard Serra comes close in, 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 in some of his uh -huh. Tauruses and Torque Ellipses, uh -huh. where what Richard has managed to do, what I think is extraordinary, uh -huh. is detach the experience of the, object, of the subject from the understanding of what the object, the time of the object. Whereas architecture has traditionally been the subject uh, through <clears throat> uh, a series of, of, of iterate moves, understands the object. You understand a Palladian house because you walk in, you see a colonnade on the, on the right, you turn around, you see a colonnade on the left, you can draw the plan and say it's a symmetrical plan. And so that time of the object and the time of the subject unfolds together, right? Uh, what Sarah does is produce in the torque ellipses, and he challenged me, and, and in the Tauruses especially, go experience the Taurus, Peter. You're, you're a, a subject who knows how to experience. Now draw me what it is. And it's impossible through experience to draw what it is. And which means he's detached experience from the time of the object. And, and that's <laughs> quite extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And so if one can detach experience of this mm -hmm. project from the time of the project, and I, I, I believe that we have tried to do that, um, uh, that's an, a, for me an interesting uh, discourse. And for me, where architecture is today is if, if in fact, uh, as post-structuralism will argue, that there is no one-to-one -one relationship between sign and signified, that is, between the thing itself and its meaning, right? And architecture, uh, the column has always been the thing itself plus the sign of the thing. It has to look like a column in order to be a column, otherwise it ain't, uh, because we don't know if it's structural or not. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is if we can unmotivate that project, that is, the relationship of sign to signified as a unitary condition in architecture, we will have approached something very different uh, than has been the traditional notion of architecture. And that's what we're saying is that ain't, them ain't gravestones, by the way. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to skip that and go straight to the big project. Okay. This is it. This is Santiago. Yeah, yeah it's a project. It, well, it's a big one. I mean, and this is about, um, and I'm trying to remember, a million and a half. million and a half square feet. Undercover. Square meters. No, no. Man. Square feet. Sorry. Square meters. Square feet. Square feet. 150,000. Yes. 150,000 square meters. Sorry. Yes, we discussed that. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you something about this question. So you're going to show my slides. I guess I am. You can, too. No, no I don't want to show them. Any time. You know, because We're going to see all of them, though. What? We're going to see all of them. We can see as many as you want. No matter what. But clearly, there has been a kind of ambivalence or a kind of struggle with this question of representation right. uh, throughout the work. And I suppose what I want to really ask you, a couple of things. First of all, you know, this is a kind of one of your landscape, a big uh, landscape project. Right. Um, this comes out, I believe, of that work that uh, followed from the excavation works, right. um, but it's something very different. Now we have a kind of representation, if I may say so, Peter, uh -huh. of, of a kind of earth as a molten, you know, substance. You know, why is it molten? Why do you need to represent motion uh, now? Uh, it isn't the index of iteration. It's literal motion that you're trying to, well, to I, freeze now. 
Well, wait. Let, with let's that ask curve, with let's, that curvature. Well, let's ask the question. What we tried to do is to say that any figuration could be interpreted as the ground becoming figure. Okay. So what we did, it was a, actually a mountaintop. Mm -hmm. uh, we cut the mountaintop off. We rebuilt the mountain as a stone uh, with whatever uh, traces of human activity. Uh, and you can say it's molten, but um, it, that was not our intention. Our intention was to rebuild the ground as a series of figures uh, which were uh, an opera house, a uh, library, museum, uh, research center, archive, whatever, all right? Uh, uh, nondescript, right? And all they were were a series of, of traces in the ground of a ground that had been upheaval, let's say, from some Ur time, that these things were always there, like the Michelangelo David in the stone. They, they came up, and there they are. Bingo, right? Uh, now you can say they're molten. That's fine. Okay. So if I don't have to interpret that surface as a molten you can say material that. or a kind of that's fine. Uh, but but now let's talk about some other things. You've superimposed grids. I, you know there are a number of grids here. That's right. And they mean different things. Let's well, there. Well, first of all, no. Let, let's let's go back to yeah. the genesis of the plan. There's the medieval grid, which is the fingers of of Santiago. This is one of the great pilgrimage sites. Jerusalem, Rome and Santiago uh, are the three pilgrimage sites. The Pope is coming to open this project on November the 6th because it's an important uh, site uh, to show a relation between the secular and the religious. They have 12 million pilgrims coming this year because it's the year when St. James's birthday falls on a Sunday, so, which happens 14 times in a century. So this is a big deal. And we were asked to do a city of culture uh, in in this world. So we start with the medieval grid. Uh, when is that one? It's the one between the buildings, all right? In other words, you, you won't see. There's the medieval grid, there's the cartier, there, every evidence Th this, of... This, for example, this, what is that bite? I'm just curious. That's which. the medieval grid. Okay, so all of that... Is the medieval grid. This, for example, is not a, let's say, a trace of movement? You know, but this no, no, would, not at this all. Is it's, just it's, the, it's the cut of the medieval grid of the streets of Santiago. Then you overlay it with a Cartesian grid, a topological grid, a topographical grid, okay. and um, what we would call the uh, virtual uh, lines of force of what the... What the medieval people called ley lines. They found this place through. But when you superimpose it, more often than not, they've been superimposed on what I call the molten surface. But, what, okay. that, but then you have this surface, the ground. Well, the ground is the medieval grid. That's the beginning. No, but I mean, it's placement in section. What's it doing down here? I mean, how did, what, what established this level as opposed to this level on the roof? I'm talking about sectionally. Well, one super, is the medieval grid. And it's physically located down there? Yeah. I mean, why is it down there? Well, where, I mean, put it wherever you want. Uh -huh. There will always be a down there. <laughs> well, I mean, there will better, always I be mean, a down there because you've got to walk on something. I know, but we could have put any of the grids on the ground. Yeah, but we decided that the medieval grid was the, the lowest one. Was the lowest because it was the it earliest. Came first. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of iconographic. That's yeah. sort of dumb. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you know what? So, okay. 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 Anyway, so okay. I mean, I'm just trying to find things out. I don't mean it that way, you know. I'm just trying right, to understand I mean, I, what I'll, you I'll did answer. and why. I thought I'll maybe though, I thought it was going to be like the Holocaust Museum, where, uh, you know, no, first of all, where the, the, those two planes matter. I thought you were going to tell me this plane did matter for something other you, than. Why don't you ask Frank Gehry why the plane, what he walks on? You know, you don't ask. Okay. Why do you ask me? I would love to. Why and do, I, I put Edwin on the spot. Why don't we just look? Why don't we just look at the project? We're going to do that. Okay. <laughs> I, because you're the critical architect, we got to be critical with you. I mean, I'm, you can, yeah. No, I believe me, we're going to see the whole thing. Yeah, I would say the criticality is with. I would like to think the criticality of this project is within the project. I think it now encompasses materiality, scale, time, uh, in in very different ways. And whether you say why should the reference 
on the ground be the medieval reference as opposed to the Cartesian? But, who the hell knows? But you have, you were the person who attributed meaning to those grids a moment ago. They, and now, you know, who the hell cares? No, no. I don't care which one's on the ground, oh. but... Uh, That's strange. You know, I don't care which one means what. I mean, you know, no, so I do, actually... But, they, but the, in fact, if you looked at the plan... I care more about which one is where than what they mean, actually. And I would have thought you did, too. You used to. I mean, really. You should care more about where they are in relationship to each other and what they're doing rather than what they well, mean. Well, you know what... Rather, we, they mean we're supposed we to... We made an arbitrary decision you know, get that over the medieval that. grid was the ground. Okay, but this idea that it's the medieval ground, is the medieval uh, grid, is also what I'm kind of asking you to kind of think about vis-a-vis -vis what you said a minute ago. Well, know, wait a minute, it is... When you talked about Michelangelo, when you talk about Michelangelo, we don't look at these things and attribute these particular meanings in this kind of way. I mean, it's something else. I'm, I'm telling you... And neither did we do that in Sarah. With you the, asked me what it was... With presentness. What, you asked me what the void was. Okay. I was saying the cut in the mountain is the medieval grid. Uh -huh. Got it. I, I, mean, I know, I got it. That's all I'm saying. I mean, you can say, why'd you do that? No, uh, it's okay. I don't, I don't mind why you did it. Okay. And, I, and you know, my answer would be, yeah. why not? <laughs> all right, now let's talk a little bit about something very clever I thought I wanted to sort of show you and talk about, which is that you have represented here well, there are two different kinds of what stone. What is happening there. Yeah. And that you right. couldn't do here because this is a roof. You know, these are no, stones. Not all, but there's some, there are some stones on the roof. The roof is, a, is a, the whole thing is faux stone, you realize. I mean, it, they're real stones, but the real roof is, is underneath, right? You, well, of course, you're... it's a cladding, yeah. Yeah. You have, how much poche you have below this? Ten uh, meters. Here. Ten meters of poche, where all the mechanicals and everything yeah, else are. Yeah, right. Okay. Good. But you don't see any ducts on the roofs, by the way, right? No ducts. No ducts. No. No exhaust, no, no nothing, right? Mm -hmm. They're all under the stone, right? And the stone are laid up. There are no joints, you know, no mortar joints. You see that, by the way? I don't, you haven't pointed that out. I have not yet. Because I'm go back to for that slide. There are no mortar joints. You see that right here? Yeah. See the stones? That's right. You don't see any mortar, right? Why is that? How are they attached? They're not. They're, they're screwed to a steel frame, a three-meter high steel frame, each each individual stone, which is a meter by a meter, has four grommets and four screws that attach to a steel frame. It's attached by hand, each of those stones. Okay, Peter, I would have thought that this, you know, is representing thickness. When I see this, yeah. I mean, this isn't folding down. This is the thickness of that stone block, this stone patch of stone. Not, not only, because it's deeper than that. Okay, well it's, that, but it's, certainly, it's even deeper. Okay, but well, it's the, certainly it, thickness. It's not a face folded wait, down. Wait a minute, no. There, there are several thicknesses. If you notice, the one grid is uh, the, the horizontal grid. Yeah. And then notice the grid, the vertical grid that goes off to the right. Okay. They're all different, there are different thicknesses. Does it bother you that these lines don't, you know, Properly. That edge, that's a tough edge. That's a tough detail. Okay. Speaking of details. I know, I got some yeah. details. Speaking of details, that's a he tough detail. Criticized Tell me, wait a minute, let me ask you a question. A detail in my hey, house last night. I want to know. One detail. Go, go over, of all people. Go over to the third one over. Come here, give me, give me. <laughs> I want to ask you. Okay. Uh, where, 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 where's the, the pointer? Which here, here. Yeah. Okay. You see that detail? Yeah. How do you, how do, you do that? You take the vertical over the horizontal, or you take the horizontal over the vertical? What's the answer to that? Are you beveled the joint? It's, it's, it's a bad news situation. You see here, right? <laughs> it is a bad news situation, right? I mean, I have to and tell no you. And no one solves those kind of things. Been in that crisis right? numerous times. I've yeah. got it, but there's something I want to say, but I, I don't think you shouldn't use squares, because that is why nothing ever, you know, moves from one plane to the other the way you would want it to. Using the square... If, if you would make all these stones one dimension and only one direction, and the other direction was variable, then you could have lines that would continue from one surface to the other. You wouldn't have this problem. But doesn't this bother you, Peter? Come on. See these lines? They don't go through. They, they do. I mean, you realize that all the lines go through? No. I mean, there is it. No, no, that's... I mean, it, well, but that's, that's just a mistake. But there, there, <laughs> it's something more serious. 
Okay. I, I think you're picking it at uh, It matters, because then we get here, and it also they don't go through. I mean, Ooh. where is that line going? Well, you'd have to see the, I mean, I the, the lines in, in vert, look, come here, give me. Yeah. These things, this, fa this isn't a facade. It's a, you see this, this guy? That's goes it. all the way across into another building. All of these lines come from a series of grids. They're not just this thing here traces itself in, inside and outside. So it's not a design that we said, oh, we, we want, we're tired of glass up here. We'll put in uh, a solid panel. Peter, why does this grid, which is a major, major force in the building... Can I ask you, I, if you yes. think that I know... No, no, this. <laughs> this one gets to follow a trajectory, a kind of obliquity. I mean, it's a yeah. really powerful thing. And then it goes on the ground here. But right. all this stuff is just marching in the plumb plane. You know, it's doing what we always do. What, what's that? Does that bother you? I mean, I don't know, there's something about this kind of treatment, which is so straightforward, that betrays... Oh, it looks straightforward to you? Well, yes, because that's a very conventional kind of curtain wall construction, first of all. It's yeah, but it, it's supposed to be dumb within its... But look, look at all the different pieces that are going into it. I mean, at a certain point, things are vertical and horizontal. Let's go back Scott. to it. Okay. I mean, Jesus, I mean, give me a break. Uh, <laughs> if, if, the, if there's not enough going on in the facade for you, first of all, to ask me... <laughs> Uh, if, if there's not enough variation for you, yeah. uh, let me know compared to your facades, number it's one. Variation. And uh, number two, go back. All right. Go back. Go back. And number two, if you think I know, after 10 years of working on this project, okay, what that is, there's how no way to clue. remember it all. It's got how a life of its own. I know that. Uh, it, Seriously. It, 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 you know, uh, you, you can ask, it, does it bother you? It doesn't bother me. It's not a facade, number one. It's yeah. a trace of, of all of the energies that I would uh, like to argue are in the project. Does it look nice? No. No, I'm not talking about it looks. <laughs> what, <I'm, laughs> well, what I'm saying is, uh, well, anyway, I don't need to address does it. I, does I, it, look, it doesn't look nice. It seems to me you revert sometimes <laughs> to, you know, straightforward solutions would, because you can't do anything no, else. No, you know what? The point. cost you're, would be that's what it is. berserk. Right? Okay. Look, the fact that we screwed in all of those meter stuff. square blocks with four grommets and screws, each one by hand, is bananas, right? Okay. And now you're saying, how come you didn't do that with the glass? Uh -huh. uh, you know, look at the column. Show them the column over there. Get back. Come on. You're going too fast. No, no, show them. There. No, wait, no, wait, no. There it is. no, no, no. Look, everybody, there. right there. Right there. Show them the fact that the glass comes in. It's not that the column is fading. The columns are on the same line. It's the glass coming in and overtaking the column. All right? Uh, that, that is not enough for you. Uh, no, I, I, it's, it is what it is. What? Uh, yeah, I'm, I, I understand. Where's the, we're missing a slide. Uh, it'll come. The first one. No, the first glass floor. I guess you. Oh, I, do, I went back too fast? Too fast? I went forward too fast? Yeah. Sorry. It'll come, going. I think. I think it's still coming. Just wait. The most, but the best shot the of back. the last floor. Now keep going. One more. No, where's the first? Keep going. You lost it. You lost the best here. one. Damn. The, the, shit. Uh -huh. It's okay. Peter. You edited. The glass floor. The it. first. It's because you, you were talking said, so much, I couldn't concentrate you, when I was. You, editing. you even said. Holy jeepers, there's the thing in, in glass with the soffit and the floor. And you even, remember yeah. the shot? Not that Not one. Not this one. Although I love this too. I mean, yeah. the floor. It's glass floor. Yeah. The glass floor. Yeah. It's about the reading of between the space between being important. It might come up. It's not going to, you've lost it, but that's all right. Don't be a pessimist. Okay. Here is that. Element. Excuse Here we me. go. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Minute. I know, but look at this. I just want everybody to see that was on the facade. Right. Here's the other part of the facade that we were discussing. Okay. Show them Look that. at that. What? Yeah. Now that, that's something. Oh, planarity. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't, you didn't move it. You didn't extrude it. I think it's more beautiful. I think the simultaneity, uh, you know, of the surface and the But you talk change. about things carrying through. Yes. There's a, there's a straight line carrying through. But look what you have to do to have that happen. If the workmen were berserk. 
Yeah, I know. And a building of this scale that's very tough. That's something interesting yeah, you mentioned to me earlier. You said that the way to deal with this problem of scale, the enormity and the out of control, run amok kind mm -hmm. of production of spaces that you see in a lot of your colleagues' work, mm -hmm. is to have these moments mm -hmm. that are super intensely worked, worked out, out. Uh, like that one, that change the register, that change your attention to the whole. It might come, see. No. no, it's gone. This is second building, which is the, the library building. And I uh, wanted to, yeah, the library. Look at this. Yeah. A model of the whole building inside the building. Yeah. I mean, and, and this goes back to your process of scaling. You see, I think the work moves through a set of problems and again and again layers into itself other, other understandings of itself. I mean, you haven't absolved yourself of some of the harms. I didn't say that. They go back. Yeah. I'm still me. I know. I mean, you know, what do you want me to do, change my spots? I do think See, the sectional this, quality of this, yeah. for me, I mean, I'm a great, give me, I mean, I'm not going to uh, try and say way. it's Piranesi, but the upper level, the Karcheri drawings really influenced me, which I have. The, the upper level here coming down to the lower level, which is the, the, the intermediate level, which is the shelves, and then you go down to yet another level, which is the rare book room, and, it, and the whole section, plus the soffits, which are stepping down, um, so that you're always aware that there is, there is no single datum uh, of, of, a, of a horizontal datum. It's all about the space between the, the horizontal plane heaving up here, right? And, and this is where you get this uh, poche of 10 meters between this and the roof. I mean, so. this is an incredible, I mean, this is a building which is a roof project. You've never done one quite, anything like that, where the, entirely it's a roof, and that it's visible from afar as roof. I mean, right. unlike many, where the roof is a plan problem. Right. And here, what I wanted to just say that I think, you know, makes this so striking also, beyond what you've said, is, it, you know, you've done something to the library. I mean, one of the most kind of recalcitrant programmatic material conditions. Unlike, let's say, what you did to the curtain wall, and for me, you see, this goes, this takes that kind of set of things that we use in libraries and we have to have parking all these horrible bookshelves in these rooms and has transformed it utterly into something else. See, I wish you'd do that with your curtain walls. Yeah. Well, let's, let's uh, you know, thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> next time. I know, it's hard. Uh, wait, let, let me, let, let me, you've got this, a lot of those in your building, so it's, anyway. it's something well, that's going to happen Well, this curtain wall, next. if you look at the structure the next behind, project. No, no, you, the, the curtain wall on the project that I'm not showing tonight, but on the big museum project, uh -huh. um, is very much what you're looking for because there isn't one piece of glass that's, every piece of glass is different and the gaskets, even to the gaskets, are twisted uh, in the glass, but I didn't get there in this, this, this is the, the second, this is the last one that's being built right now. But what I think is interesting for me is you take a photograph of this, but you're not aware of what's behind you, to the side of you, et cetera. And I think the experience of the individual in the space uh, is, is an, a really, for me, uh, uh, you need to be there as you need to be at the, at the Berlin project. I don't think uh -huh. the photographs, for me, tell you what the space is like when you're in it. Um, I'm not saying good it's or like bad the floor or is, what? You know, it's remarkable because you lose your moorings, which is one of right. the brilliant things. And you know, the floor could. I know yeah. the photograph is helping it, but it's also true that they become themselves oblique in right. in terms of your understanding. You've really destabilized our experience of the space with that kind of and you get movement of. Look, I mean, you get these very narrow. I mean, look at the look at the the sequence of space from up above. Yeah. to the level, to the thin level next to the interior glass. I mean, uh, uh, and of course, drives the librarians nuts. Uh, but librarians are librarians. Yeah. So now, Peter, I want to just, uh, a few things, then we're going to have a more open, thing, we're gonna, let people we're gonna, come in. The, but I wanted to ask you something about the parametric. 
but just quickly. They're going to have a chance to and they ask can turn questions. Into, yes. Yeah. I mean, some people would say the parametric is the kind of fulfillment of a dream that you had because it allows for that, yes, for, for that kind of uh, tracing and animacy uh, to happen in a very rigorous way, very precise way, and that it ha and yours is a kind of, it was in a way a handmade way of doing the parametric, you know, it's kind of anticipated it. Though you've been railing against the parametric, I think the reason you have railed against it, if I may put this on the table, is that, you know, your interest is the historicity of the object. It is not the process itself as an objective account for the object. I never thought, and I think you've been misunderstood, about this, that I've never thought that you were so beholden to a process. I mean, what I, what I admire, what I'm so interested in always in these projects is, is that you, you know, you revise, you, you, you alter, you mutate these processes according to a reading, according to the idea that there will be this kind of history in the audience, there, 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 an idea about how we understand it, <clears throat> not just as a record of how it's made and a testament to a rigor of just uh, systems and how they produce themselves. The, the real, the real question, right? sort of? yeah, let, let's ask the question. Yeah. If you get to a situation where you can write an algorithm, which is not based on anything, what I call uh, of the um, <clears throat> unique qualities that architecture possesses, or the problematics like corners, et, mm -hmm. et cetera, um, in other words, its, um, it's condition of, of uniqueness. The, the real issue is if you produce an algorithm that can produce infinite variability, let's say, mm -hmm. then the question is how do you choose? And if you fall back on function or you fall back on sight or you fall back on materiality or fall back on structure, you're back in the same game. So if you can produce infinite variability from an algorithm, um, uh, my, my question is, how do you choose? And of course, the how do you choose is the thing that has to be built in to the algorithmic process itself. In other words, the, the critical choice says, while I can produce this variability, I have to be able to find the mechanism for choosing. That's what I object uh, to about the out of control algorithmic parametric processes that the control, that is the critical control which allows one to say this is better than this one yeah. or this is a good one of these. It's not, it's like uh, a mathematician can, can say uh, X can solve a problem uh, and Y can solve a problem, but Y is more beautiful even though the same the, it's the same solution. Uh, why is why more beautiful? I'm asking the same question. What is inherent in, in a particular process, in a particular iteration, that makes it more beautiful? In, that is what I would call more critical unto itself. And I think that's where we haven't gotten yet. And I don't know the answer to that question. But that, for me, is my concern about uh, algorithms run wild. I mean, it seems to me you continue to go back, for example, your work on the canonic buildings, right. to look for those uh, criteria by which you establish a, crit a critical well, the building uh, establishes means of judging. its own... Uh, but you've uh, elucidated, uh, yeah. you've brought it out, I mean, right. through that discourse, so that we can make the judgments. I mean, you're looking for particular readings or particular experiences I, of space I, when you get into that. I library. believe that... You're in it, in, spatially. That see. Jackson Pollock is a great painter, to understand Jackson Pollock, you have to understand what makes a good Jackson Pollock, right? And it seems to me that someone who knows the work of Jackson Pollock, uh, n not anybody that walks into a museum and says, I like that one or I don't like that one, but understands what makes for a, 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 what I would call a critical Jackson Pollock as opposed to another one, uh, is what I like about the possibility of Francis Bacon, of Jasper Johns, of Rauschenberg, of the Bronzino drawings at the Met. Someone who knows Bronzino can tell you why this one is better than that one, right? Mm -hmm. And makes a fabulous argument for that. And what I believe that architecture can do and has done and will continue to do, that there are better Palladian villas than others, uh, that there are better uh, Corbus than others, 
that they're better Mises than others, that they're better Rems than others, uh, they're better Zahas than others, and because they have the inherent capacity to uh, allow for a critical matrix to surround them. And I think the only architecture that, and Moneo is the same way, I think Raphael's work is extraordinary. I don't necessarily agree with it. And I think that one of the things that animates your work, uh, and I'm not here to, to give out you know, gold stars or anything, but they, it has, as you know, uh, its own mechanism of, of self-criticality, which I think is that it makes certain of your buildings better than others, and I don't want to go into which ones, uh, I think, but we're, and it makes some of mine better than others, and I do know which ones are better than others. Uh, we all, you know, if we make what I consider canonical, that is cusp buildings, that is yep. things on the edge, if we can make two or three in a lifetime, that's a lot, right? Uh, I don't know whether Corbu did more than that, two or three. I don't know if Mies did, and they're great. Ex I don't know if Sterling did, if Rossi did. I, I know Aldo didn't. Um, and so we define, for me, canonic as those buildings that have that critical edge as a, mo a, a, a terribly important moment in the work, right? And um, uh, those kinds of what I believe is important about this learnt teaching is so that a student, first of all, understands what that can be, how it's possible, and how do you translate that into their own work? That is, how do they, w what is the, the project, right? Um, and um, I mean, to me, the, the questioning of the science, uh, sign signified relationship. To me, the questioning of the metaphysical dialectic, the questioning of architectural always mean, uh, is what my project is about. Mm -hmm. It takes different forms. I believe there is a project. Uh, people can say, you know, you don't have an urban project. You know, I don't. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's, my, my project is flawed because it does not have the sense of of the urban as I think is in REM's project. I think REM's project is a fantastic project because it does involve uh, the urban. It, it, it has an idea of the urban, uh, whether it's Melon Sonar, whether it's uh, La Villette, whether uh, it's, um, you know, uh, the Green Archipelago. Uh -huh. I mean, Unger's is the same way, has an idea of the urban in it. Um, my project has never had that uh, in it, and uh, I don't think I'm going to be able at my age to say, oh, let me think the urban, uh, because uh, I, I frankly, I'm not able to do that. I ain't convinced where you are. I mean, for me, you're on a cusp. You could move to the, I mean, I think the Israel project has an idea of the urban embedded in it, which the project in China doesn't, by the mm -hmm. way and which makes it a very different project. Yep. And, and, uh, and whether you can continue to uh, elaborate into the urban from the, the individual building, uh, but I think that's, you have a project, right? We could define it. Uh, Stephen Hall has a project, Tom Main has a project. I think there are architects who have a project and some of the work is better than others. But I think for me, Santiago, why Santiago is, is, is crucial, and of course, history will judge. You know, uh, I can't say, oh, it's a terrific project, uh, because uh, history will tell you whether it's, it's, a, it's a good Peter Eisenman or not. Uh, it's certainly at a scale that I've never attempted before. Yeah. Um, and can one make a theoretical project at that scale, a material project and a scale project that deals with the issues that are part of my project. Uh, and that's what's up for grabs. That's why we're, I wanted to show it today and to ask the questions of, 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 of the students. So maybe they, they can. Let's hear from them now. Question. Yeah, sure. Or any of the faculty, you know, et cetera. Anyone who wants to jump in? There's no anxiety about jumping in. Yeah, There's one. 
A little louder. Louder. Yeah. Well, uh, I never mentioned the term, but certainly partial figure has been a, an interesting problematic in my work, I think, um, because uh, once I start to say the ground becomes figure, um, I don't mean the ground becomes figure in the sense of uh, iconic, recognizable figuration. Um, I'm much more, I mean, taken by uh, Francis Bacon's partial figures and the whole receding into the canvas and, and becoming, uh, which are easy to do in a, in, a, in, a, in, in a painterly sense. It's much more difficult to do in, in an architectural sense. Um, uh, I would like to think that there are, there is a whole overlay of issues of, of partial figure here and in, in this particular project, it reaches a certain extreme on the interiors. Interiority and exteriority uh, are, uh, is another whole issue because um, interiority could be either whole figure or partial figure exteriority. Um, and uh, also in, in, in the post-structuralist sense, you know, what is interior to a discipline and exterior to a discipline? Those lines are supposedly blurred. And so what we're, we're trying to do is to blur the distinction between interior and exterior as a, as a real condition. In other words, where is the uh, beginning of the inside and the end of the outside? And I always use as an example uh, Aldo's, uh, Aldo Rossi's um, Galaratesi project because you could, you could argue that since the windows in the, in the interior, for the interior, are too large for the rooms. And you could argue that the, the facade, which has those windows, is the right size for this plaza next to it. So that you could argue that the facade of Galaratesi is the, is the outside or the, the out, outer layer of the outside of the space. And that the <laughs> interior is is doesn't have a facade but bangs up against the facade of the outside uh, because therefore the windows don't fit on the inside. Mm -hmm. You could argue the same thing about Adolf Loos's Muller House and any number of houses which has a, a an outside uh, which relates to the public domain and the and the symmetries of the public domain which have nothing to do with the interior organization the promenade architectural and other things that happen in, in Los's houses. So I, can, I, I, I would argue that there is a, a discourse of interior exterior, which also is a play between what I would call genius loci and zeitgeist, because both Rossi and Los are conflicted. Uh, I mean, Los is zeitgeist on the outside, genius loci on the inside. Uh, Mies, the Tugendhat house. Uh, zeitgeist on the outside, genius loci on the inside. Rossi, the same thing, is, is zeitgeist on the outside, genius loci on the inside. So to me, uh, the metacritical dialogue between inside and outside devolves into the relationship between uh, whether we're dealing with the dominant condition as placing, that is the, the priority to place, or the priority to time. And um, I think those are the, the, that's the critical matrix between the two. So I don't use interiority and exteriority because it gets involved in a, in a philosophical 
uh, dialogue is what is interior to a discipline and exterior. But I think architecture deals with real interiority, real exteriority, and therefore deals with uh, the question of space and time or place and time uh, in a sense which doesn't affect other disciplines. It's uh, an autonomy uh, that architecture deals with. And so therefore I'm interested in Los, I'm interested in Rossi, I'm interested in people who deal with those, those cusps between the, what you were calling interiority and exteriority, uh, between what I would call zeitgeist and genius loci. Uh, so I don't know if that answers your question. And that ends up for me as impartial figures. Yeah. Yes. Development of abstract expressionism, um, and I think it's it's a really interesting model to sort of set up, you know, automatic painting and and uh, emergence of of parametric architecture. And I'm just wondering because you know you was, you're making the the comparison between parametric on one hand and abstract expressionism on the other. I I'm saying that no, no. when you're bringing up Pollock as that as sort of. Uh, understanding that there there's a development of a kind of high style well, let's or a bring critical up, dialogue. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I would I would have thought that abstract expressionism, let's say, on the one hand today would be Zaha, uh, on the one hand, and I don't know who would be an example of uh, parametric processes. Okay. Greg Lynn, automatic uh, painting, what Alejandro, whatever. Um, so, w what what are we to say? Oh, no, I, I was I'm sort of more interested in <laughs> the idea that, uh, and Jorge was talking about this, that no one really knows what to say about it, but could it develop its own critical dialogue to sort of become a, a sort of high style? I, I mean, it, it has to, but using that as a sort of model for it. Well, uh, I, I don't, I mean, he, if you're saying what, what's, the fu what's possible in the future, I haven't a clue. Uh, I know that we we're at we I believe that Zaha and Frank and others uh, we are in the Rococo modern let's say uh, <laughs> we are at the very I mean we are exhausted okay and so uh, I think there's a great <laughs> wide open uh, situation for everybody in this room except the named people uh, because they can't help what they're doing, but you certainly have, uh, uh, there, there, there is going to be a paradigm shift, I believe, if, if not an epistemic shift. Uh, I think the social and economic conditions of plenty have changed that. I don't believe that they, those paradigm shifts have anything to do, as Paul Krugman points out to me, uh, with the economics of sustainability and environmental change, but I do think the 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 exhaustion of capital uh, and the 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 for me the no longer struggle between capital and and the social well-being of people uh, is is slowly eroding. I mean, people who are out of jobs and don't have health insurance are certainly happy to have health insurance. I I would argue. Uh, and I think that the morality of the state is, is uh, 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 I, I think that um, there are enough people that are arguing that there, there will be changes in the social, economic, and political structure that architecture will follow in some sense. And what that will be, uh, what the world will be again, I don't know. But I, I do believe that within the next, uh, I'm not a fortune teller, but all of you will witness in the next 20 years uh, radical change, whether it's change that's new, but radical change in, in, the, in the epistemic relationship of architecture to its uh, social uh, functioning. I think so I'm a little bit, if I may, about the Krugman, I'm a little confused now, because on the one hand you're saying it seemed to me you were saying architecture has no agency there, you know. It's There's no agency in that. No. Like, you know, it's Wicked not, Witch of the North telling the, not, the West, get out of here, yeah. you have no power here in, the, in Oz. And on the other it, hand, you're telling me, uh, you know, we're going to see that that will have an impact. I think that, that we, are, we are behind. We are not following it. 
we're uh, we're no. behind now, but I don't believe yeah. I don't think the, dis the the discipline is disappearing. But I'm trying to understand to what extent you think that the paradigm change that you're saying would happen after the Rococo is going to be something to do with I don't know what for example the know. economy that you just said they might I don't have know to do with. I, I, I said I don't know curious that that's what you were citing as a source I, I guess given the Krugman comment which yeah. you seem to suggest that would not be what would matter to architects I would say yes I, I would say yes but I don't know what that what does that look like I'm not outlandish is, is too negative. I'm just saying that, that some of the sort of biomorphic architecture that we were looking at last night would maybe be a, a sort of counterpoint to the sort of political and economic forces that we actually might be responding to. So. I think my only argument would be that music, uh, art, literature have always been important to the idea of culture. Um, I think that there's a difference between all the books you see in the airport and a great literary work. Um, um, I, I think the same thing with, there are a lot of street corner painters, uh, you know, they're a dime a dozen. Uh, and I think the same for architecture, that there are millions of architects, maybe, but a very few uh, deal with things that are significant to the culture supposedly what this school is about, because it is the elite school in the world, uh, has a responsibility not to the ordinary, but to the extraordinary. And that if you believe that, and you know you shouldn't be here if you do not believe that architecture must inhabit the extraordinary, and that you uh, need to fulfill that role which Harvard, that's why you're here. I mean, otherwise you'd go to Yale. I mean, you know, uh, I, mean, this, I mean, this place must, must be the Hertz rent a car because it ain't Avis, right? And it, it has an enormous responsibility. That's why I'm very happy that I don't teach here because that responsibility would be too much for me. I, I, don't, I, think I, I would crack under that responsibility. But I do believe that Harvard has that. I'm very happy that, that Scotty is, is one of the leaders here. I'm very happy that I know uh, some of your faculty, are, uh, you're in good hands. Uh, I think the students here are fabulous. I don't think you drive yourselves enough. I, th I think you're too inhabited by a sense of well-being. Uh, I, I don't think you push each other enough. I, I don't think the, the, the scraping and rubbing and feeling of, of, of the need to be better, uh, I think there's too much complacency. I know it exists at Yale because they know they're second best, right? Uh, but you all conversely know that you're first best. So uh, there ain't enough. Uh, I mean, Colin Rowe used to say that uh, uh, guaranteeing institutions, and certainly Harvard and Yale guarantee the, the American world, Harvard, Yale, and Princeton guarantee the University of Michigan, uh, uh, Texas, California, etc. Uh, and often the institutions uh, which are guaranteed are better than the guaranteeing institutions. That's what worries me about the model of the hierarchical model that we have in the world. Uh, because the responsibility of the guaranteeing institution is enormous. The other guys can do what the hell they want, uh, because the University of Michigan ain't going to be Harvard ever, 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 uh, no matter how good it is. And uh, I can tell you, uh, the, the rabidity of a Cornell hockey fan in beating Harvard, like no other team, right? Uh, when they play Harvard, there is this sense of awful urgency, right? That, that you know, they throw fish on the ice, uh, squid, I mean, alligators, whatever, right? As a, as a symbolic gesture of that anxiety which breathes deeply in them, right? And you have to realize it breathes deeply in Sarah Palin and Tea Party, etc. <laughs> It's all over this world, right? And uh, no, 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 it's it's true. So therefore, I'm saying is 
you don't do well enough to deserve that anxiety in these people. You need to do better uh, for me. And you need to answer the question, what will it be? Because if it's not answered here, it ain't going to be answered out there. Uh, yes. You don't Somebody agree? The table. Oh. OK. Uh, I, I think you're a guaranteeing institution. Um, Oh, if Jesus, we were, no. If we, were, if, we were to compare, <laughs> no if, if we were to compare Conor Reggio and Santiago, yeah. um, you know, we'd, we'd like to trace some similarities. You say there is. That, you say that you know, the voids are just a trace of the medieval grid, um, or, uh, that, but that the ground is still the figure. Um, how, how has, the, there's no L anymore. You mm -hmm. know, there's, there's differences and there's similarities. How has the subject's position changed? Um, well, I, the reason why, I mean, is the honestly, moving through space now? the subject is so different. Look, all you have to do is go and see HIMAT, right? I mean, I mean, I think it's really important that every architect go and see the 15-hour film HIMAT. In the start of HIMAT, the space of Germany is seen uh, from somebody walking home from World War I. There are no cars. Uh, and we see the Hunsruck, uh, this idyllic place of Germany, at the, f at the first minutes of the film. In the last minutes of the film, we see an American jet flying over the Hunsruck uh, at a speed that the, it becomes just a dot on a virtual grid, right? It no longer exists to anybody of any value at all. Walking doesn't exist, etc. It's, and, and so therefore, the play between uh, 1919 and 2002 is enormous. And so the subject's capacity to understand, I mean, you know, thinking the first time I went to England, I went in a boat, right, and took six days. Now I go in six hours. There is an enormous difference in the subject's relationship to space and time, right? And we have to deal with that. I mean, we're still the same subject. But so, look, before Freud, the subject did not have a, an individual unconscious. There wasn't a collective unconscious, but it was never articulated. We're still physically the same size, but psychologically, now that we know, we're different. Psychologically, the fact that I can travel at 800 miles an hour uh, to go somewhere has psychologically made walking in the Hunsruck a very different experience than it was when it was the only thing I could do. What does that mean for space and time that we deal with? That's a good question. You don't think that could be measured yet in the difference between I didn't say it couldn't. I said, I, I'm not a measure person, right? Uh, I'm saying is that um, people still, uh -huh. the pilgrims still walk from, from southern France to Santiago, right? and they walk at the same speed. But most of the people, like the Pope, come in a plane, right? They set him out 100 yards from Santiago, and he walks the last 100 yards, and they take a picture of him, you know, as a pilgrim, right? <laughs> so that ain't the same, right? So even that has changed, right? Uh, we're all going to have photos of the Pope walking the last hundred yards with his crook, et cetera. But he got there in an airplane, right? Uh, so it's different. The pilgrimage is different. And so things have changed. How do you, do you think your project can mark this? When will we know whether your project marks this change in the last 30 years? I'm not saying that I even attempt to mark that change. I don't know if I, 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 I understand what, the project would be. I'm not sure that I am able uh, to understand. I'm, I'm saying is you might be able to calibrate that. I don't know if I even attempt that in my project. I recognize it as a difference psychologically, uh, and I'm asking you all to recognize the difference. What does it mean to the space that we are inhabiting? I, I don't know what that means yet, but I think it's a good question. I think you ought to ask some of your teachers that. Uh, I, I don't have the answer to that, and I don't teach that. I mean, I'm still, my design projects are still back in the 16th century where I do understand uh, what the problematic is.
Um, but, you know, um, maybe, I, I can't answer it. Good project. Well, why? Because Hanukkah for me is, uh, uh, if, if you take a, a trajectory from the auteur film and you go back to the auteur film, uh, for me the, the line to Bresson, where Bresson is the, the I mean, where the visual uh, narrative experience of film is totally, in a sense, unimportant. I mean, if we remember Pickpocket, uh, Bresson shows you the, the guy, he goes to the racetrack, and the next thing you know, he's in the police car. And all of the important action, how did he get in the police car? Uh, what happened to him? He was, you know, did he get caught by the cops? Why did he get caught? What did he do wrong? All the things that are important to the idea of Pickpocket are not shown. So Bresson is the first person that begins to show to break up the narrative and not showing you what the hell's happening, as opposed to Godard, who in fact shows you what's happening over time, but uh, in a jump cut. In other words, uh, Gene Seberg is sitting there with Belmondo, and they're smoking a ci he's smoking a cigarette, and the next thing you know, there are 20 cigarettes uh, in in the ashtray. You know, time has passed, so he does jump cuts. Bresson doesn't f give you the jump cut. He just cuts out the, the narrative structure. Haneke shows you the narrative structure, but it has no meaning. In other words, who, who's the guy? And, and he gives you all sorts of filmic clues. For example, in, in Caché, there, there are two different cameras. Uh, there's the camera of the, of the voyeur who's filming the house. We don't know why he's filming in the house. And then there's Haneke's camera who's uh, uh, filming uh, the actual happening, and it's a different camera. And Haneke is very clear on this. And in the end, who, who is the guy holding the voyeur's camera? We never know. We think we would like to know, and we think that the film is about that, but it's not. It's about the play between the two cameras. Uh, Funny Games, I mean, to me, is an incredibly, I mean, it is a film that is the most horrific film uh, that I've seen in a long time, and you see nothing. All of the violence occurs off camera, and all of the violence is built up in a psychological way, so that, for example, when, the, when this psychotic in the white comes into the room, and of course it's different in English, the remake in English and German, because if you don't speak German, the layer of the subtitles takes you away from the horror, so the horror is much closer when you know that it's East Hampton or Cape Cod or whatever. But when the first guy comes in and he says, they said, ask me to get an egg, right? And you think, what's wrong with this guy, right? And he takes the egg and he drops it, right? And he says, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Can I have another egg? <laughs> and you know, and you're thinking, holy Jesus Christ. And then uh, he takes the other egg and he goes out the door and then he comes back and he says, the dog ate, the I need another egg. I mean, and it is, you, you really are getting very upset. Uh, and then, of course, when finally, and the cheer goes up in the audience, when the, the woman grabs the gun and shoots the guy, uh, and, he's, and you know, finally there's relief. And then he says, uh-uh, he pushes a button and says, nope, that's not what really happened. You know, we're watching a film. That's not what happened. That's what you'd like to happen. Now I'm going to show you what really happens. And he rewinds the film, and uh, they grab the gun before she can shoot it. And the whole thing is, to me, one of the, I mean, it is post-Bresson, okay? It is after Bresson's uh, play, which is after uh, Godard. So if you take the line from Godard to Bresson to Haneke, I think it's, it's quite extraordinary. And for me, it deals with subject, time, space. And there's nobody in architecture who has achieved for me what, except maybe someone like Richard Serra, uh, has achieved what Haneke has achieved. And so I'm fascinated with that play of subject, object, time, space, 
uh, the denial of narrative, the denial, and of course, Haneke would argue that his films are about orality. And of course, if you look at White Ribbon, that nothing happens, and the space of, the sound of silence in White Ribbon is, is stunning in certain scenes. And, and, the, and you looking at this door, it's like Bresson, you follow, in Bresson, in, in Pickpocket, there's a scene where a door closes, and you usually jump away. In a Hollywood film, you never see the door actually close. In the Bresson film, the door closes, and you sit and watch it for five seconds, an interminably long time, uh, on, uh, focusing on nothing. And in the Bresson, the door closes where the, the father, the, the, the pastor is beating the kids, and you hear nothing, and you're watching the door, and you eventually hear sounds, but you see nothing. You know, you imagine what's happening. And I think, for me, uh, those are things that are, are really critical to cons thinking architecture today. And uh, they, these kinds of aporias and, and silences happen in, in, in literary work. I mean, I, we, we could make the same play between early pension, middle pension, and late pension. And I think Haneke is an example of, a, of, a, of, of the late moment in film, which I think is, uh, is quite extraordinary. But I, I've been fascinated with him a long time. There's a new book that just came out, uh, an anthology of essays on Haneke. I have an essay in there, uh, uh, which is, uh, it just, been, just came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, but he's, uh, all of my students, watch we we watch Haneke together so I can't tell you anything more than that Ingeborg you yeah I'm, I'm kind of curious and this is a uh, question for you and Scott and I would like you to answer first um, we have currently some discussions about what uh, constitutes a discipline of architecture now you talked a lot today about Derrida and right now about film and I'm curious um, and I think you suggest that uh, these two different disciplines tremendously as a philosophy and um, maybe film production would uh, tremendously influence your architecture so I would be curious um, in which way we talked about that yesterday a little bit too when Jorge was talking about the impact of science um, in, in literature um, that you may talk a little bit about how literal one can do these transpositions or one shouldn't probably um, and the role of the discipline in architecture in the past of your work and in the present I think we kept talking about it and I would like to hear it from Scott too where he would see his position um, or what the current situation of the discipline is well I think first of all what was interesting about what Jorge showed when he showed the image, uh, 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 the the Haydn music, and and the the image of the the world creating itself, and uh, what Jorge was saying is no matter how li alliterative or metaphorical or analogous, what was interesting about the Haydn was within the music there was in this oratorio the internal creativity, the internal combustion which hadn't been seen before. So the analogy wasn't a literal one to the thing, but was internal to music, which uh, I subscribe to. So uh, I thought his, uh, you know, the way of, 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 of placing that between Haydn and creation and using the, the oratorio, I, I think was, it was extraordinary, but you could also use Beethoven's Misa Solemnis as, as Adorno does as Edward Said does, you, there are any number of people you could use to say that we're talking about the internality of the discourse. Mm -hmm. Now, what I would argue, and I think uh, probably Jorge would agree it's not relevant to this discussion necessarily, but for me, the discipline is always made up of states of exception. That oratorio of Haydn, no matter what its metaphoric uh, resonance was, was a state of exception of the discipline at the time. Uh, Wagner's Tristan and Isolde uh, in the asymmetrical triads that uh, animated that in between uh, the, third, uh, the third act of the third of the ring cycle uh, was thought in England at the time when it was first performed not to be music. That is, it wasn't music. And of course it was a state of exception that uh, changed music in, 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 a, in a radical way and changed Wagner's whole idea 
in the, in the in the Gotodamarung, and in the the last act of of, of Siegfried. So um, I I would argue that states of exception have always been what define discipline or discourse, uh, not the normative flow of things, but the the energy of exception, and but exception. Uh, also is with, within, uh, in other words, it has to have a critical resonance with some disciplinary activity. In other words, um, sound is coming, I mean, and, and, and how sound relates to instrumentation and performance, and, and of course you can bring the computer in because you can say the, the, the uh, synthesizer and the electronic uh, music and performance uh, changed, you know, from the spinet to the piano to the synthesizer, uh, different music was then written. Um, you can say the same thing, different music is now going to be written for architecture. So um, I would argue it's a, it's a continual state of transformation. There is no moment of stasis for me. Uh, the discipline has, is always moving. Um, and uh, what constitutes a state of exception is what is interesting. In other words, if the state of exception has a critical nature to what went before, then I think it's part of this uh, evolutionary process. But maybe Scotty has a different answer. I, I really, you know, I'm with you on that. I mean, I think, Jorge, you, I mean, we, we are, an agreement and to a great extent about this interiority and the importance of it. Right. I mean, what, what I think you have to do is, you, uh, you know, you talk about this guarantor institution. You have to sort of have a scheme of what are the, the general areas of inquiry in which we find these problems. I agree that the problematic and anomalous things are the way into the problem. The real and issue is... you call is, them states of exception, you can call them anomalies. Yeah, but let's... let's, let's here, here's what you it... You can't teach them as a kind of standard. There aren't norms per well, se. Well, here is where we are on the tricky ground. Let's raise the specter of sustainability. And let's say the two people sitting here at this table, and maybe Jorge would agree, that sustainability to us may not be a state of exception which will lead us to a critical discourse, right? Now, we may be seen, as, and I, I don't want to necessarily speak for you, uh, I, I would have thought you would agree with that. Um, uh, some of us have this intuitive feeling that sustainability ain't a, a, a state of exception, okay? And it isn't going to lead us to anything but up a, 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 a path to no end. Um, I believe that. I believe that it is a mode of capitalist consumption that has been foisted on a lot of uh, unrealizing people that uh, we need to have sustainable projects. I mean, the Paul Rudolph building, which I think is a great building in a state of exception, got a LEED certificate. If Paul Rudolph can get a LEED certificate, any damn building can get a LEED certificate, okay? So if any building can get a LEED certificate, then where the hell are we? What, what, what state of exception is there? Uh, to teach sustainability as a central discourse to architecture is, is miss for me, missing the point. I have yet to see a sustainable building that deals with architectural issues, all right? And all I know is that the worst architects I know produce sustainable buildings that are god-awful, right? But Peter, what if I were to say to you, just because you're a devil's advocate, yeah. you know, all this... I may be wrong. Somebody wants to set up this kind I of... I may be wrong. Thing, and it forces us to reinvent architecture as an exception to it. Can I, I tell mean, you why what? can't it be well, the most productive I, tool of all? It should, things? but go and try it. I'm saying is I've yet to see... I'm, I'm saying I'm just I, 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 am, I am too old to chase this thing down, as far as I'm concerned, anybody's welcome to do it. I, if anybody stood up and said, you know, sustainability is going to be that state of exception, I would say, bravo, could you show me soon, right? Uh, I, I, I'm placing my money that it ain't. But we've seen it again and again when a system takes over everything, right. that architecture takes an exception to it. I mean, the reason right. why I told the allegory about right. the top of Marzu I agree. is because 
when it reaches the point where it is all and everything, architecture, it would have to begin again. And so I think there is that that is possible, though I, but I think what you're criticizing, what Jorge would criticize too, is that people think the sustainable is the state of exception itself, or they think it is architecture yeah. itself. No, it isn't. And they're mistaken <clears throat> the part for the whole too. Let's face it, it is, a, it is one of many constraints. I mean, when fire code, you know, when we had an earthquake in San Francisco and the whole city to just destroy everyone, didn't make architecture, you know, it's about fire safety, you know, it wasn't all about fire alarms architecture. Um, I mean, maybe there was an architecture of handicap ramps and all of architecture is about that when that first became I believe, problem. but I mean, in a way, I believe, a lot of unfortunately, going that around. architecture is very difficult, <laughs> as I believe uh, literature and music and painting, all of these things are really difficult. And there are always people trying to, uh, um, you know, uh, make uh, uh, another world and say, this is what it is. So you go to the uh, bookstore and you see junk on 99% of the bookshelves, right? Uh, and people say that's, you know, that's what sells, etc. cetera. Um, I ain't convinced that uh, sustainability is anything more than all those damn bookshops filled with books by those people but for you, who don't read. But listen, for you, the metiers, you know, space and form right. and uh, syntax and corners and, right. and, and, and a philosophical kind of argument. Well, corner is, for a, example, is a big problem. I know, but somebody else says, well, the whole formal project is over. That's over. Fine. They can say that. Now, then what? Is, could the metier absorb, they may be you right. know, air? Uh, they, you know, if, for they example, may be right. as Liz says, it's about, you know, it's air and noise. She puts these terms on the table, and that's the thesis yeah. of architecture. Can I tell you what? Yeah. You say corner, she says air, for example. I mean, just to give you how, what, what is the state of this uh, kind of I think, uh, met here? I mean, can I tell you what, I'll tell you what I would... Uh, Inga only, says, where are we the if the discipline argument, has got this kind of range? And the problem. only argument I would say for these people here, I think you've got to learn what the dif discipline was. If you want to get to air, you've got to know how did we get to air as the discipline, right? Then, once you can do that, you're free, right? But I think what Harvard is about is understanding what is the nature of the discipline, what has it been, where is it today, where is it going. And if it's going toward air, then you can go that way. I think that's great. But until you know what the discipline is, you can't start out and say it's air. Because <laughs> I, I, I just don't think it's been that way. You know? I, I don't think that people who are into uh, rap music or jazz music or 12-tone music, they start with Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven, etc. They learn what music is. Uh, they learn what is uh, the organization of sound. Yeah. Of, of People don't have enough patience. Students don't have enough patience well, you know too, today to even learn that for just three years of their lives. They want to bypass it right away and get right to the air. I tell you what, that's your problem. No, it's everywhere. It's all I, over. I know it. If they, if they don't have enough patience, which is part of the, the, the syndrome of today, nobody has any patience to sit, st sit still, uh, then, um, you know, uh, fine. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we don't want to learn about medicine, we want to learn about herbal, yeah, the, herbal you remedies. That? You know, just go into the There's no thing. discipline, there's no, there's, you don't want a doctor <laughs> that doesn't know about how to assess your problem, right? You want to know that he's been to a good medical school, not to some witch doctor, right, uh, et cetera, some, some homemade, you want to go and say, why do you think the doctors put those Harvard Medical School certificates on the wall? Yeah. But Peter, uh, you, you, you could say there's a little bit of you in here, which is this, listen, in that you talk so much about a kind of teleology and a kind of zeitgeist condition. I know you put it into a context, a broad theoretical context, but still, even the questions about where we're going, what's happening next, what the future is, all of this conversation is what is part of, fuels this sense of urgency which asks that everyone, let's say, bypass that lesson that you believe is so fundamental. There's a kind of conflict between the desire to be in the here and the now I and can, to learn everything that one would have to know I, to be here. I can say that because I've, I've been doing this for 50 years. Yeah. And I think I still go back and reread uh, the lessons that I learned 50 years ago. Yeah. And so 
I don't think there's any, first of all, where's the rush? They get out of school in three years. No one's going to give any of these people a job before they're 40. <laughs> so what do they do between 28 and 40? You know, they want to work for Rem Koolhaas for 12 years? I doubt it. Or Zaha? Uh, or me? No. <laughs> for Christ. So what the hell do they do? Uh, you know, uh, I think you, it, you, there's no rush because no one's going to give you anything to do. Uh, and, and in case they think so, they're mistaken. But do you, let me ask you something. When he got asked that question, or anyone does, I mean, in a, in a way, I'm like... No, she know, was asking because you have defined, she's I asking said there that question. Be, there, there are certain dis, discursive conditions that no, define the discourse. No, I didn't define discourse. discursive. No, well, that's I why she asked I said the question. there are areas of the discipline we need to cover in this curriculum. And I, but the way I would get at them, if you look at the way I write the projects, is very much in what you're talking I about. I didn't say, no, I didn't no, ask No, I'm the just going to tell her then. I mean, because, for example, if I say that we have to deal with the inside and the outside, the tectonic through geometry, we have to deal with the relationship with the building to the city, or we have to deal with the part to the whole. If these are general categories that an architect has to understand and deeply know, the way you get at it, though, would be to set up projects that problematize all of those, and that's the way I always do it. I never lay down these general rules of how you handle the part to whole relationship. Can I, can I so just... You have to be, what I'm saying, uh, uh, Inga, in your question is, I do think there's some broad territories that the, 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 the whole curriculum has to delve into. Can the I, question I have is, shouldn't it be so obvious to us? Shouldn't it be so kind of self-evident that we know what our discipline is? And, and that this question in a certain way, when no. she says, it could no. it be air? No. Well, you said it can't be air. No, it, no, so, it. I mean, I'm a little confused. Let me, let me, you let, let me, it run let me, let me, or not? I want to let them go. Yeah. Uh, I want to one last thing, because I'd like to have, as a guest, the last, a last word. And that is, I don't know in history, up to the present, any architect that I would consider critical or approaching a certain level of greatness that hasn't spent an enormous amount of time studying the discipline. Robert Venturi is one of them. Uh, Rem is another one of them. Zaha, I mean, any number of people. Uh, Rafael Moneo, uh, a, a great example of that, uh, have studied the discipline. There ain't no shortcut for anybody in this kind of a discipline. Uh, there is no rush. Uh, what you can't learn it all in three and a half years. All you can do is know what you need to learn. And the, uh, the best thing about an education is when you get done, you can say, uh, I didn't learn anything. Then you've been educated. Because then you can really start learning. And so there, ain't, there is no such thing as we're going to teach the, you can teach what the hell you want. Uh, because in the end, when they're done here, they come out knowing nothing. And if they can believe that, that they, the 150K went to learning nothing, then they're, they can start. And I, I, I think we all ought to say, God, you know, God bless to that. And, you know, let's get done with knowing nothing as quickly as we can so we can start learning. Thank you very much. Right, that was good. <laughs>